What I think is especially important for the light worker type of person is to really actively translate what your financial goal means for you in your day-to-day -day life. What is the real purpose for your money? Translate that and get excited about that money goal. The other piece of this is focusing on high ticket sales initially. Uh, I would say 95% of my clients do. We teach people to, to be sought after, to attract, to have clients come to you and let it be this organic way of doing it instead of a way you feel like you're kind of inserting yourself or you people might not want you and that can feel salesy and icky to a lot of people like us. Hi and welcome to this new episode of The Light Leaders. Today I'm with Elena Ray and I'm really excited. We're going to talk about how to be widely financially successful and successful in general with a coaching business for light workers specifically. You can see the chapters at the bottom of the video so you can navigate to the parts that really interest you. But Elena, thank you so much for joining. I'm excited to have you. I've known you for maybe four or five years when you were living here in Ubud and I've seen your consistency. You're a business strategist and mentor for online service providers and entrepreneurs in the personal branding and self-development space. You're the author of Becoming Self-Made and the host of the Intimately with Elena Ray podcast. You've built a multi-million dollar coaching business and simplified online marketing so others can do the same. So I'm excited to have you today. Welcome to the show. And my first question to you is, what are you grateful for right now? Hmm. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. Sometimes I pinch myself still that that all is true. I also remember meeting you five years ago when I had moved to Bali on a one-way ticket and was literally you know, a broke nomad, just come out of the corporate world. I'm very grateful for many things. Number one, I just bought a house in Austin about two months ago. So I'm officially, it's my third property because I have two in Bali. But this one feels very different and have my roots planted here now. And that feels very good. I'm also very grateful. I was leading a free training last week and I was just marveling at how on a Thursday afternoon, my job was to get on Zoom with 150 people and talk about how to help other people make a living from their dreams. And that this is my Monday night is the only piece of work I've done today. And what a blessing to be so free to spend our time and energy doing nothing but the thing that we were brought here to do. Amazing. Thank you so much, Elena. And I feel that's really important. Actually, in the past few weeks, I've conducted a market research for my own coaching business, seeing what do light workers need the most and what came up the most was to sustain themselves financially, doing what they love, doing their mission and their gifts and having fears around, I need to come back to my nine to five. And you're someone who not only sustain yourself, but is absolutely thriving um, with your coaching business. I know now you, you're extending to other things. So we'll definitely talk about how to make a lot of money as a light worker and explore potential self-sabotage, limiting beliefs that people have around that. But yeah, starting with your own journey, what was um, a mindset shift that made you really successful today? So many. I'm glad we have a lot of time today. I think one of the biggest things around money is that I noticed that when I had sort of abstract ideas of what I would do with the money, or it was just an ego metric, or it was, yeah, I want to make 10K at the beginning. My goal was just to be able to afford my bungalow in Bali, just to be clear with everyone. I didn't set out to have a multi-million dollar business. That was not the goal. The goal was to be able to book one-way tickets to travel whenever I wanted, to afford my bungalow in Bali, to see the world continuously and not have to ever go back to a paycheck. But there were times where I felt, oh yeah, I'm setting my financial goals based on what I see other people doing and what I see is the norm in the industry. And that just kind of reinvents the corporate ladder where all of a sudden you're setting your mark on something that's just a number for the sake of it. And so what I think is especially important for the light worker type of person is to really actively translate what your financial goal means for you in your day-to-day -day life. So you might not need 10K a month, you might need five, or you might actually need 25. And whatever you know metric you see on Instagram just wouldn't serve you. Do you want to retire your partner? Do you want to put your kids in better schools? Do you want to buy mm -hmm. your own home? 
Do you want to invest in other people's businesses? Purpose, I think, is one of the most important forces that money seems to be very attracted to. Money is a, an energy, a life force, and it wants to be around other life force, not just to make you feel good about hitting some random number. So for me, that really shifted when I realized how important home would be to me. I've been living out of two suitcases for seven years when I moved to Bali, growing my business and working three different jobs to make that happen and really had not had roots. And so you've been to my home in Bali, one of the properties that I own. And I remember walking through the doors of it for the very first time in 2020, the pandemic had hit. Everyone was fleeing Bali. Everyone thought we were crazy for staying. And I found the most incredible place. And I just had this awareness of, I actually want to buy this place. It's such a crazy idea. I don't have all the money for it, but I want so desperately to have a place that's mine and only mine. And I haven't had that in nearly a decade. So that was my little purpose. And that's grown into a multi seven figure real estate portfolio. And I would love to also talk about building assets and net worth and real financial freedom mm -hmm. so that we can use our coaching businesses. Like to me, my coaching business is not where I'm going to create financial stability for the rest of my life. I use that income. It's that's not really how I'm planning to create my wealth, let's say. It's a cash flow that then I'm putting into other things that are creating wealth that are going to last. But that would be one of the first mindset shifts for people of what is the real purpose for your money? Translate that and get excited about that money goal. Really let it feel in you know, your whole body, in your heart, that heart resonance of, hey, this matters to me. And this thing that matters requires resources. And as I think there's, maybe this is another question we can go into, but I do think there's that, what can be that limiting mindset in the spiritual community of people saying like, oh, I don't really care that much about money or I don't need that much or kind of rejecting it. And that will keep it separate from you. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I love that distinction around not necessarily just putting up a, a number, but actually saying what it's for, what the money is for and rather than just a number. Uh, I love this. I'm curious with, um, yeah, the, the potential limiting beliefs of the light workers or why they separate themselves from money. What are the most common you've experienced in your coaching? Yeah. Let's see. Number one, the like guilt, shame, you know, if I'm really spiritual, I shouldn't be so concerned with money and sort of seeing money as a zero sum game, where if you put more energy towards it, that means energy is coming away from something else. I think that's one of the most important ones to mm -hmm. draw attention to that just because you're saying, and, and this would be a mindset I would really offer to people is say, money is important to me. My finances are a top priority to me. I'm really focused on this part of my life right now. And being able to say that with pride and certainty and clarity and a heart centeredness and know that just because something is a priority doesn't mean it's taking away from other areas of your life. Just because you're going to focus on growing your wealth doesn't mean that's coming away from your freedom. That doesn't mean it's coming away from your time. It doesn't mean it come, it's coming away from your health. And in fact, the more that I have focused on money and I've coached hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who've gone to six and seven figures at this point, that that only reinforces those positive qualities and habits that you have. So the more resources you have, the better your health will, will evolve into. The more time you'll be able to allocate to your other interests and passions, it's not the other way around. So I think that's a really important one. The second one would be this kind of what I call otherizing, where someone might look at someone with more wealth and go, oh, well, she's different from me. She has a different background or he has a different background or she had a leg up somehow or, you know, she teaches this that's different from what I teach. And they'll come up with stories and excuses to create this false sense of separation when in reality, anyone who's doing the thing that you want, they're like in the neighborhood, you know, they're like hanging out in your space. They're showing you that this is available to you, too. And the more you can look for the similarities and how you are the same and where your story unites you. Like I didn't come from money. I come from a background of a lot of contraction around money and parents who worked very hard for a paycheck. I regularly now will make in a day what my dad used to make in a year working on roofs and doing construction work and working in the elements, coming home dirty. And that was how he provided for our family. 
And then the third thing would be, yeah, things like that. Like if you come from a background where maybe your brother or sister or mother or father like didn't do well financially, there can be this, well, how, what is it going to be like if I outpace them? Or if I'm earning what my father used to earn when he was working very hard and all of a sudden I'm a light worker, I have a message, I have something that comes quite naturally to me. I think most people find that their work is something that, wow, I could do this in my sleep or this just feels so good for me to do. Am I allowed to get paid so much more than other people in my life who are seemingly working harder or working in a different way for the things that that they're doing? So that would be the third thing to embrace of like, hey, I can make money easily from things that do come naturally. And just because they come naturally doesn't mean they should be low priced or free or given away easy, you know, just very easily. Thank you. Thank you for this. It's interesting the last one you shared. Yeah, there is sometimes that idea that if you have a gift, especially if you're a healer, you should you should give uh, that for free. What do you say around that? <laughs> then by all means, run a nonprofit organization or do that in your spare time and have another job and do that on the side if that's what you want. But most people who are listening to us right now, they want a business. They want the unification of here's how mm. I make money and support myself on this planet because that's what we have that's the system that we live in we need to utilize resources and money it's the the real world structure that we live in and they want to embrace that and be able to function in it while meeting that need in a way that's their what their soul came to do one of the things that people will tell me is you know elena i want my work to be really accessible like i i would love to learn you know high ticket sales and to build a seven figure business like you have, but I also want to reach people and I want to reach people who maybe can't afford my services and et cetera, et cetera. Well, and I'll say, we need to adjust the timeline along which you're looking at this thing. So if you look at it like, Hey, my first year of business, I want to give away so much for free. Or I want to make my programs really low cost. And I want to reach thousands and thousands of people. What will happen is you'll build your business around a model of needing volume and needing the lowest viable part of your audience and market who are most difficult to actually work with or get to make a purchase. And you'll wind up burning out in the first year of your business and fundamentally not make any money and not reach anybody and not give your gift. Where if you switch that timeline to let me think about, all right, I'm going to be in this business for the rest of my life. How about I have a five-year timeline? And in the first two to three years of my business, my goal is to become as stable as I possibly can, as resourced as I possibly can, and work with a smaller number of people who are really committed, who are that top caliber of people in my audience, build the foundations, build recurring revenue, have programs that people know you for and sell more and more easily every time you launch them. And then at that point, you're going to have team members, you're going to have resources, and then you can do what I've done. And then at that point, write the book and tell the things to people or get on podcasts like this or make lots of free trainings or do a you know donation-based program at that point. And then as your career builds momentum, you'll be able to give access to things more and more readily and you won't burn out. And that to me is the best recipe for being able to be inclusive in your business over a longer term, more grounded mindset. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, I feel very aligned with that. And um, let's get a little bit more into the strategies for growing the business. I think that that's going to be super valuable. I just had a couple of reflections slash questions as we were on the money mindset also. I really like when you shared um, taking from others. I actually have a story from uh, six months ago. I was flown business class for an event in Ibiza. And it was actually a little, quite interesting for me to see like, me going in business class when maybe older people would be in economy and feeling like, oh, who am I to be in business class was where anyway, I'm not going to drink the champagne. I'm not going to eat the food because of my raw vegan diet. I'm yeah. spending half of the flight dancing in the back or meditating. Probably so many people would need it much more than me. But then it's like that's that's the scarcity based mindset where I feel like when I have, I'm taking from people. So that's a little reflection I had on this. And another one um, I'd like to ask you about is I had at some point, I, I was aware when I was working on money that, okay, if I have money, I have more responsibility in a way. And I was using the lack of money to 
make excuses for, I don't know, if, if I don't want to do something, then well, I don't have the money. When really in truth, I didn't really want to do it. But if I had the money, I'd have to take the responsibility of saying I can do it, but I actually don't want to. So as the people, people pleaser in me sometimes liked to not have money. Yeah. Was there an area, just to explore that a little more, was there an area that mm. you, like, what does responsibility mean to you? Wait, specifically, where would that show up? Well, in the in the limiting belief, it was like something on my shoulder that I felt I had to do and I didn't want to say, I didn't want to do it. My more empowering view of responsibility I have shifted is actually using the word responsibility. I, I'm, I'm able to respond. And that feels empowering now. I'm like, okay, I'm stepping into my power. But at that time, it was more like, um, yeah, let's say maybe going to France in the summer, maybe I'd rather stay in Bali. And it was quite convenient that anyway, uh, flight tickets are expensive. So it's a good excuse for I can stay in Bali. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I have, I, you know, and I get that we're sharing the limiting belief version of this because I've definitely heard similar types of limiting beliefs from people. And what I love to offer is the money actually gives you more choice. Money is your ability to say yes or no to things. And you have the freedom to put yourself in the spaces and the rooms and the situations and circumstances and remove yourself from situations and circumstances where you don't want to be because you have that freedom. Mm -hmm. We were talking about, I spoke on a, a panel just yesterday in Austin, a big like financial freedom event. And one of the speakers had been canceled. And we were talking about what's the best way to like deal with being canceled or the fear of cancellation and what people are going to think about you online. And we all agreed financial sovereignty is the best way to be able to guarantee that you can speak your truth no matter what. And I think that's mm. a point that a lot of our listeners probably really care about is building up wealth and assets. Then go yeah. spread your message and you don't, you don't have to worry about anything because you don't need anyone to purchase from you. You've already set yourself up differently. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. And I love what you shared about the, the choice and actually Actually, in that case, it was almost like I, I didn't want to have the choice. The choice can, you know, from an unconscious place, choice can be overwhelming and we prefer to not have that freedom. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and one other thing was at, at the time, I was a little bit rebellious with the system and I didn't want to participate so much in the fiat money system. That's when I was doing a lot of courses on cryptos and um, which is, I'm still a fan of, but. Yes, in the end, I definitely think it's better, even in the fiat system, if we already do well, because that's the system we're mainly using at the moment. It gives you the option. You know, some people are like, I'm a crypto investor and you know, really support that world, but I want to succeed in both worlds. I want to have a solid foot in each and have the choice of, well, I can play here, I can play in real estate, I can play in crypto. And yeah, choose, choosing to set yourself up for the ability to... You know, there's people I know who build their wealth entirely in crypto, and that's a great choice for them to make, to have that choice. That's the point. Hey, amazing, Elena. I'd love to ask you, um, why do you want to be very successful financially? Like, what's your grand vision? Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like I've so far surpassed, because like I said, I didn't set out to make millions of dollars. This is really a an after effect of me just doing what I love and it kind of taking on a life of its own. And then me being like, okay, let's just go with, with this and embrace this whole new lifestyle. So I feel like I've gotten to a point where I'm, I'm kind of semi-retired is what I call it at 34. I have properties and things that support me and with my masterminds and business, you know, coaching business that I run, it's really optional at this point. I don't have to enroll clients. I don't have to take on private mentees. I don't need to sell for the sake of selling. And that's a point where I actually wanted to get. This is sort of, for me, what the goal of financial freedom is as a creative. I, I view myself as a writer and a creative and a thought leader above all else, is to get to the point where we don't have to bend or twist or do anything to sort ourselves in any way, really. And there can be this purity of creation. Like really the programs I create now or the interviews that I, you know, I get to do like you, with you or the, the event that I did yesterday, it just comes from like, wow, I genuinely want to do this. And I think the caliber of what we can create and who we can be when we're not just concerned with survival and that's sort of been taken care of. And there's this base level of abundance. 
And then like, we don't stop. Like just because I'm semi-retired doesn't mean I'm ever going to stop doing the things that I do. They're just done at a different frequency. So for me, I think that's one of the most interesting things to play with as someone who's pursuing financial freedom. And I think for me, it has been breaking a lineage, like through my ancestors, you know, poor Italian immigrants and, you know, a family lineage that struggled with money to really be able to live out this story to show other people how they can break their stories and their lineages. And no matter where you come from, like I never knew a millionaire growing up. I never knew an entrepreneur. I had no leg up. I still don't have a plan B in my life. So if anything were to ever go wrong, I have nowhere to run and no one to fund me like that. It's a story I know a lot of people do live. And I think I was given this blessing to be able to be a, a voice for people like that to show them, hey, you know, if I can do it, you can break this too. And the more we embody this, the more stories and lives we can shape. And that's for me, it's not about accumulation at this point. It's like, Hey, I've reached an awesome level. I want to bring as many people along with me as I can. That's my role. Amazing. Yeah, thank you. Let's go into the, um, the coaching business because the foundation of your wealth has been or is the coaching business. And then in the second part, we can talk about the asset management in the words of Robert Kiyosaki. It's like make money work for, for you, right? At some point. But for the first phase, you generate the cash flow with a coaching business. You've done that really well. Myself and a lot of the people uh, who subscribe to my channel are really interested in uh, often coaches and really interested in um, making a being successful with it financially, business wise. How did you do it? How did how do you recommend people do it? Well, I often get asked that, like, how did you go from zero? You know, 2018 or 2019, probably when I first met you, I was just finished a yoga teacher training. I had done Reiki training in India. I'd been on this, you know, seeking quest of my internal world, and but didn't have a clue how to translate that into an actual viable business for myself. And that wasn't that long ago. And, you know, fast forward five years later, multi-millions. I did write a book, Becoming Self-Made. So I will give as much as I can in this episode. If anyone wants to hear the full story, I wrote a book on the full story. But strategically, one of the biggest things that helped me is to first create some context. I've made multiple millions of dollars. I've never had more than 10,000 followers. I've never gone viral. I've never worked to appeal to the mainstream. And I think a lot of people listening to this probably vibe with that. Like your message is powerful and it's not for everyone. And I would, I would agree with that. I think my message is not, it's for the top of the bell curve. It's for a very conscious part of the population. And that's the way I like it. I don't want a lot of people in my energy. I want the right people in my energy. I've also not built a business on going and finding clients and seeking and sending out. Like I have never taught in my life an outbound DM strategy, an outbound sales strategy. We've not made our money through ads and funnels. We don't teach our clients to, yeah, go and, and search. And we teach people to, to be sought after, to attract, to have clients come to you and let it be this organic way of doing it instead of a way you feel like you're kind of inserting yourself or you people might not want you and that can feel salesy and icky to a lot of people like us. So I think that's some important context on the strategy because I often get asked about the, just the fundamentals of it. So within that context, it's so important to be intentional because I didn't go for volume in my strategy. So I have to go for intention, clarity, and quality, which centers around messaging. So I've really just dominated on one platform, Instagram, but I have a lot of clients that dominate on LinkedIn or TikTok or other platforms where I'm not even there, but the strategies work so well that they work on no matter which platform you might want to be on. Some of your you know, people listening today, you might be on YouTube. Great. Amazing. But the point is that you don't have to be on YouTube and TikTok and LinkedIn and Instagram and have a podcast and write a book and do all of these things for volume. It's better to pick one and focus on your messaging. So messaging to me is this art of translating. And I think so many of you who are listening, study things or working on things that are a little bit more conceptual or esoteric or intangible of sorts. And that can feel hard to express. It can feel hard to get it into words so that other people understood, understand exactly what is the value of what you do and what is the change that you make in someone's life when, hey, the change could look very different depending on who the person is who's receiving this gift that you have. 
So I've developed a whole messaging strategy around helping specifically people who have that type of problem with their marketing to figure that out and to crystallize it into messaging that your ideal client is going to hear and not think, oh, wow, that's really nice or that's really inspiring, but I don't know exactly how that applies to me. Like they, they get it at the level of, wow, I, I understand the transformation and how the investment that that person is asking is, is a match. And then the other part of this, I could go a whole, like, I teach on that very extensively. The other piece of this is focusing on high ticket sales initially. I would say 95% of my clients do. There's a very small percentage that that do low ticket and we we run that strategy, but mostly it's how do you find the top quality client? How do you really expand your ability to receive more and work with the best of the best initially? And then when your business is anchored and like you only need 10 clients, if you charge 10K to make your six figures a year, then at that point, run a low cost program or then you can you know write your book or do these other things if you want or scale in, in different ways. But I find the high ticket sales, it doesn't come intuitively. It's not something that you're just meant to like download and be able to watch other people do. It's it's a skill. It's like learning the piano or the guitar and it takes time to learn. But I think it's one of the most valuable things to spend your time learning because that's what really moved the needle for me is I was struggling to sell like a $1,500 or $3,000 life coaching offer. And then I spent about a year working with two different coaches who taught me high ticket sales. And by the end of those periods of time, I was selling 25 and 50 K offers. And I've continued to just slay in the high ticket realms and help a lot of healers and light workers. You know, a few people in my mastermind have been, you know, somatic multimodality practitioners selling an 18 K offer. People who came in charging $250 a session for embodiment work now have a 10 K offer that they've sold. Things like that happen in my world because of the preciseness of the messaging that we don't go volume and we go crystal clear and we focus on like, all right, let's teach you the high ticket strategy. Thank you. I love that. And I I do find also there's so much logic in starting with high ticket, probably one-on-one -on -one, and then maybe a high ticket group and, and then look into the evergreen and and the other things because... Um, it's it's really where you nail the fit to market. I think a lot of people who try to sell low ticket, they have an idea of what they want to sell, but they don't exactly know what the person really, really needs. With high ticket, you got to know what a person really needs. Not a, People don't pay $10,000 for something nice to have. They, they pay that for something they really want. And so you have to nail your messaging and through that. And yeah, of course you can then more easily get the financial burden. So it makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. And I think it's a, my approach to business is sometimes people are really well-intentioned and really smart, but they're solving the wrong problem or they're doing things in the wrong order. So for me, a lot of business strategy is making sure that you're doing things in the right order, like you just outlined and that you like, if your problem is, I don't know how to sell high ticket because I don't know how to do that yet, I'm going to try to just go for the low the low ticket course and, and pursue that because that's what comes more easily to me. That's still the wrong approach to business. It's better to stop, learn to solve the most important thing that could lead you to actually on your path of abundance and solve that problem first. Or if you feel uncomfortable on sales calls, it's not like structure a business where you don't sell or have sales calls. It's solve that problem and get really good at that and overcome mm -hmm. that. Don't move away from it. Or some people listening to this may have had group program experiences that didn't go so great. And so they think, oh, maybe groups aren't for me. It's like, no, that's the problem to solve that and helping you get good at serving more than one person at a time. Thank you. And actually, it solves different um, different like challenges at the same time, because I find that it's really helpful also for something that a lot of light workers especially face in the coaching industry, which is choosing a niche. A lot of light workers are very interested in so many different topics. I'm actually in the middle of it while I was coaching people on health. And I'm actually now switching more to, let's call it the, biz the business side. And I'm also interested in a hundred other things. And I find that if you do one-on-one -on -one coaching, actually you can more easily be broad. Well, if you do a group coaching or an evergreen, of course you need to niche, but then often, um, I don't know, the niche can be a little bit artificial. It's like, oh, you need to choose a niche. Well, the approach I like to do is you do one-on-one -on -one having niche hypothesis 
but you can actually switch very quickly. So in my case, after a few clients in health, I was like, ah, that's not my highest excitement. I changed. And I hadn't built a brand on it. I hadn't built, built a book on it and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I've helped a lot of people on niche over the years who are like very all over the place and very niche resistant. I have resources on that. If anyone, you know, wants to reach out, we've got plenty of master classes and things to, you know, help you with that. But a few of the things I would say is number one, I namely work with multi-modality, multi-passionate, multi-dimensional people. And there's a strategy that I use called like sub niching. So you can have an umbrella brand niche. And then underneath that, you can have different programs that are a little bit more specific based on someone's specific problem or desire that you might have like these mini camps within your audience that follow you for different reasons or like different aspects of you. So you can do that and then, you know, create a product suite that has that variety in it, but the programs are still very niche themselves, but it doesn't box you in. The other thing I would say is that most niching problems are not a strategy issue. It's a mindset issue. So 95% of the people who've come to me with niching problems, there's usually something going on in the back that's preventing them from making that decision because they believe if they make the wrong decision or choose the wrong niche, it won't work. Or there's like, a, you know, if I, if I go in this direction, that's not as profitable if I go as I go in this direction. And what I have found that truly I've worked with every possible niche under the sun of the, in the last five years I've seen people make millions of dollars from absolutely everything you can possibly imagine this, the spiritual space and beyond when it's really the thing you are meant to be sharing. That is the thing that's going to be profitable for you. And if you could just decide no matter what I do, this is going to take off like crazy. What would you pick? It usually there's like a little bit of a different lens of the evaluation process of choosing that niche. And also like what you share it, you can just pivot, you can move. People are not like you know, evaluating you and being like, oh, wow, she talked about that for a while. Now she's talking about something else. And uh, oh, I don't know about this. They're, they're not really paying attention, especially if what you're talking about wasn't initially interesting to them. So if there's that freedom to pivot, freedom to evolve. I started as a career coach, then I was a self mastery coach, then I was a life coach, then I was a spiritual business coach. And now I'm just a business coach. Five different things in six years. <laughs> And all have been successful. Amazing. Yeah, I love um, my coach, the moment William Griffin, that you probably know, I love, he, he talks about those niche as niche hypothesis and they come to you and something to take loosely, not like, okay, now I'm locked in and I'm going to have to do this for the rest of my life. And I love that you bring always the, um, the time frame in it because People want to do everything at the same time. They want to do all these different topics and niches and the book and the podcasts and the groups and the evergreen programs. But yeah, you can do that. But over the next 10 years and have a, a solid plan, if you try to do everything at the same time, it's probably not going to work out very well. <laughs> totally. It's one of the biggest things I'm on my soapbox about lately is there's a lot of people who get this impression from Instagram and from other coaches that these things should be happening along a very fast timeline. When in reality, to build a coaching business, the way the model works is there's like a year, two years, maybe even three, depending on who you are and what background you're coming from. There's no set time frame. But during that, whatever that period of time is, you're going to be doing a lot of work and putting yourself out there for very little reward or validation. However, mm -hmm. once those seeds that you're planting during that time start to bear fruit, they, they bear fruit in multiples that create this momentum because of the nature of a relationship-based business. You're out there for the first years, putting yourself out there, establishing authority, figuring out your niche, testing your offers, getting to know people in the industry, getting to be known for what you do, getting good testimonials from clients. Mm -hmm. And then people start to share about you in, in ways that are literally quantum. But you have to be prepared to go through this period of time where it's going to look like it's not working, but it is. Mm. Thank you. Markers of your success, by the way, it can be um, there can be a big discrepancy between the revenue and your results on social media. You shared that you don't have you don't go viral so much, or you don't have that many followers. But so it's it's more important to have like those few key people that need to follow you and listen to you, so you can build a very successful business like this without having a huge audience on social media. Yeah. And that's just works. what works for me and what works for a lot of my clients who are, you know, energetically sensitive people or just feel that that approach works for them. But then there's other people in my space who do want to go very broad and reach the mainstream and have, you know, hundreds of thousands of followers. And that's their highest 
truth. And that's great. There's strategies for that too. But I, I like to share my story because I think it takes the pressure off of people who think I'm going to need and Oh my God, she's made multiple seven figures. I'm going to need so many people to be able to achieve that. I'm going to need to work so hard. I'm going to need to work for so many years. And it's like, yeah, I put in the years and the time and the effort, but it wasn't like a crazy amount of time either. You know, like five years, my life has drastically changed. And I think if more people looked at their business with a five-year perspective, instead of like, how much money can I make next month? we would see a very different vibration in the coaching space. Thank you. Let's talk about the asset management that as you've generated a lot of cash flow through your coaching business. Um, do you feel the next best step is to become really good at investing and may making money work for you? Absolutely. It's something I've gotten really passionate about teaching over the last year or two since I actually started to receive the benefit of what that does for someone, I left Bali a year and a half ago. That means that I took my dream property there that I built and developed over a year and I turned it into a business instead of my home. And in that, you know, in the last year and a half, I've seen, okay, this is, I've learned a lot. It was not like I knew how to run a, you know, a large property in a foreign country either. I had to learn by just throwing myself into it. But, you know, developing the team and having people who manage it for me and getting that recurring passive revenue is a game changer. It feels completely different in your nervous system. It's such a different channel of wealth. It's such a different at, like kind of business to have. And so I really love having multiple kinds of businesses that way. And then I've reinvested a lot of the money that I, the initial property has made me into a second property. And my goal is to every year or two to purchase another property now that I have the systems running for it and breaking down ideas for people to think, I don't know if I'd ever be able to own property in my home country, or I don't know if I'd be able to, to do what you're talking about. That sounds like so far out for me. And I like to really bring it in for people and say, you know, number one, go do your research. It's probably not as crazy as you think it is. You know, I just bought a house in the U S as well. It's a different market, but I figured all of that out. Go and meet with agents and go and tour properties and go and ask questions about loans and mortgages and alternative lending methods. You might find that you can actually get a property for like 5% down in your home country if you have, if you meet different requirements or like get, you can get really creative and wind up owning a piece of property instead of throwing your money away in rent every month, which I've heard people say that I never understood before until I learned how having a home is like a piggy bank where instead of paying rent to other people, you're putting it in this piggy bank that it stays there and accumulates and all grows. And then you can sell that asset and basically get everything back that you put into it when you do that. How amazing. So those are, um, I, I want to like put this on the radar of people of not dismissing it as something you'll do one day or doing it far off in the future, but actually how can you take those initial, like the first six figures you make in your coaching business? If you do implement the strategies Alex and I are talking about today and you, you know, work hard for a year or two, first six figures, go put it down on a property, go invest in Bali. Bali is an, an amazing market and you could start your investments way sooner. And it's really important, no matter where you are in that investing time frame cycle, to set aside a percentage of your income, no matter what. I mean, this is, you know, classic good financial advice. 10%, no matter what, because that doesn't mean, it, you know, it doesn't matter if you have a low month or a high month, you're still setting aside money into a pot that you're declaring and giving a purpose to this is going to be money that I use to multiply elsewhere. And that might be crypto for some of you, that might be real estate for some of you, that might be other people's businesses. It could look a lot of different ways, but that's an important practice to start now. Like as you sign off this podcast, go open that account and go set that practice up for yourself and then set up dates and intimacy with your money where you not only are looking at your money and looking at your spending and figuring out the best ways to invest, but you're also spending time learning about money and researching opportunities and taking courses on things and meeting with agents and, and whatnot to actually start to action that part of your wealth strategy. Thank you, Elena. Yeah, I think uh, that's going to be very helpful for, for people. And so you can, they can see a bit of the, of the whole journey on this. I'd love to ask you as we're touching upon the, uh, the end of this episode. So you're doing so well. And at the same time, I'd love to ask you, what is your main challenge with your business right now? Which is also a great opportunity usually. Mm. Well, I think I'm at the point where I've gotten the business to be consistently at seven figures, you know, roughly a year and what an amazing place to be in. But 
I want to up level to 5 million a year. And that is a very big difference in business model and strategies at every level. What takes what it takes to get you from zero to six figures, very different from six to multiple six, multiple six to seven, and then seven to like high multiple seven, very different. So I think that's been the biggest challenge of, you know, lots of entrepreneurs will go through a, a season of a plateau. And so I'm planting the seeds and taking my own advice of, hey, you know, this doesn't happen overnight. Just because last year I decided my business is going to grow to 5 million doesn't mean it's going to happen in 2024. It might not happen in 2025 either. I'm taking the actions, I'm planting the seeds, I'm shifting aspects of the model that will be in alignment with that. And then it's for sure that will happen, but I don't know along what timeline and I'm not going to get it too attached to that timeline. I have been increasing the passive income in the business, the automated part of the business, and really doubling down on signature programs in our product suite like Sapphire and focusing on scaling and holding more people in the programs we've been running for so long with such great results. Easier said than done. Taking a business to 5 million a year is entering into a percentage of the industry where maybe it's like 0.0005% of coaches will ever hit that level. Mm -hmm. And it's aspirational. It's, it excites me. And, and I'm curious above all else. It's not, I, I want to make $5 million a year for the sake of it. It's who would I need to become to, and who do I need to grow into and how do I get to show up and what parts of myself do I get to stretch in my visibility and the way I create to create that version of the business? I think that's what's most exciting to me. Okay. Amazing. Thanks, Elena. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Alex. It's been so fun. Mm. Yeah, it's been really fun. Do you have any, um, yeah, what, do you have anything you'd like to share with the audience before we wrap it up? I think this concept I've been harping on a lot lately around what I call the tipping point. And for those of you who are listening to the audio, you won't be able to see my hands, but there's like this graph of the shape of how mm -hmm the coaching business model really looks like. And so there's this first half where it looks like you're trudging up a hill. And this is where most people give up or panic or do all the wrong strategies or think it's not working fast enough. And that's like the seed planting. But it's sort of like the sissy fuss, you know, where he's pushing that, that ball up the hill and it kind of rolls back and he's still pushing it up there. That's what coaching feels like for a while. And I like to just get that out. It's not the sexiest thing to talk about. And I think the one of the benefits of me being semi-retired is I can kind of scare people off. I can just kind of say things that are true that other people don't say in their marketing because they need to make sales. And if you say some of this stuff, people will run for the hills. I like my people to be prepared. It's like, if you're prepared... To just spend that amount of time building your audience and testing your offer and testing your niche hypothesis that you talked about and developing your sales skills and learning messaging and putting yourself in better rooms and listening to podcasts like these and doing those things to support yourself, what happens next is amazing. There's actually a tipping point on top of that hill. And if you don't know that, and I've studied many, many coaches for so many years, and I see this happen in everybody's business, there is a tipping point. And what happens at that point is in that hard work that you had to do without validation, that you had to put yourself out there without the likes, comments, you know, as much revenue as you want to see on the other side of it, the, the slope starts to go downhill and you have this grace and ease that supports you on that side of the business. And that's usually after like, let's say 200 or 300 K where that starts to kick in. And so actually the more money you start to earn at that point, the easier it gets. Then you have team and you have support and you've built relationships and people are seeking you out. People are recommending you. Your audience is growing organically. People are sharing your stuff. The word of mouth has set in your organic strategy on platforms is taking off. And then like, there's no going back. You have hit a stride. And so what I share that with people so that you don't give up before the tipping point, so you don't burn out before the tipping point, and that you stay and you follow the path very faithfully and know that if you make it through that point, which a lot of people are going to quit, but if you make it through there, things like support will take over beyond you. And there's there's no words to describe when I, you know, when my business hit that point and when my work, you know, I hear people all around the world talking about my book or, you know, sending me messages about things. I'm like, wow, it took on a life of its own. That's available for you guys. So don't quit before that point. Amazing. Beautiful message, Elena. Thank you so much. I actually have a last question. Um, <laughs> how do you feel in Austin after Bali? I knew at some point you were hesitating a little bit. 
Yeah, I know. I came back in December, right at the end of last year, because I was feeling a little uncertain. And I hit my tipping point. I hit my Austin tipping point where I realized that this is exactly where I want to be. And I feel so committed to being here. The community is incredible. You have a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of the conscious community, a lot of the biohacking, wellness, crypto. It's this hub in the world. A lot of people are congregating here. And I've just found a lot of the Texas values and the, the culture here. It, it has a culture. And coming from traveling the world, I like to be in a place where there is, you know, Texas has its thing. And I, I really like that. It feels very down home, very authentic, very sweet and welcoming. The people are so nice. And so I love it here. And I hold Bali very dear in my heart. It was a wonderful chapter of my life. And I'm grateful to have assets and community there. And, you know, we'll continue to have a relationship to Bali. But this is home. Amazing. Thank you, Alina. And I've seen quite a few people in Ubud when they go more entrepreneurial actually go to Austin. There's a strong connection <laughs> there. I'm holding the entrepreneurial flag uh, in, in Ubud because uh, I absolutely love it here. But yeah, it's, uh, it's two beautiful places. Yeah, I'm glad to hear it. They need you there. Thank you so much, Elena. Thank you so much also to all the listeners. And uh, have a beautiful day, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please hit the like button. Now, I'm Alex, and I'm passionate about supporting the rising consciousness of our planet. I do this with the podcast. We have a free group on Telegram. You can click the link in the description below to join a group and connect with all the light workers and leaders of the new earth. Now, if you're also passionate about creating and growing your soul aligned business, there's also a passion of mine to support light workers and leaders of the new earth to do that. So I'm currently offering free sessions. If you'd like to receive that, again, you can find a link in the description and I'll speak to you very soon. Have a beautiful day.